Hello, everybody. <laughs> Good afternoon, and welcome to the May Lunch and Learn session um, on the Palliative Symptom Management Kit, Supporting Expected Death in the Home. Um, my name is Stephanie Hendrickson. I am a knowledge broker at SARA, and on behalf of our centre, I'm pleased to open our session today and introduce our presenter, Catherine McIsaac. Just a couple of things to mention before I turn it over to Catherine. Uh, the session today is being recorded for your awareness, and it will be added to Sarah's education archives on our website, which is sarah.lakeheadu.ca, um, under our knowledge translation section. Um, also, we will send out a copy of Catherine's slides after the presentation today. We do ask that you please stay on mute throughout the presentation, unless you're asking a question or making a comment, of course. Um, and Catherine is happy to take questions throughout her presentation today. You can uh, put your questions into the chat box and I'm happy to bring those forward. You can send them to me in a private message um, or Catherine will be pausing periodically to, to check in with us as well. Um, it would be great, yeah, at the end of the session if people are willing to, to come on camera and unmute themselves um, to ask questions if we have time for discussion as well. If you do have any technical problems of any sort, you can send me a private message and I'll do my best uh, to assist you that way. And we also have Carol Bold with us from Sarah as support and you can um, also connect with her. So I'm going to introduce our speaker today without further ado. Um, so welcome to Catherine McIsaac, who is a resident of Th the Thunder Bay region where she has lived since 2004 and both a Bachelor of Arts in Sociology and a Bachelor of Science in Nursing. Um, has helped to shape her knowledge and understanding of the needs of community. And Catherine has been an RN for 13 years, practicing mostly in the community setting. Uh, while much of her nursing work experience has been with home and community care support services, it is through providing hands-on end-of-life care in patients' homes uh, that her passion for palliative care developed. So welcome, Catherine, and thank you very much for being here today. Hey, thank you so much, Stephanie. Um, so this topic is, is quite near and dear to my heart. Uh, over the last couple of years, um, there's been a lot of attention and, and focus on how we support symptom management for patients that are wanting to palliate and potentially die at home. Um, and just how as a system do we work together, like pharmacy and service providers and coordination and clinicians, like how do, we, how do we work together to best assess and then support those needs um, of the patient and their family? Um, you know, there's multiple providers that have multiple points of contact. And then, you know, there can be a lot of challenges in that. And we cover a huge region. So, you know, we're up here in the Northwest. Uh, you know, we're, we're recognized as the largest, uh, well, I'll say Lynn, uh, catchment area within uh, Ontario, and there's a lot of a lot of challenges around that. So we're really trying to work to make sure that our communication um, is is good to best support uh, the needs of you know those patients and their family uh, when they are wanting to and are able to um, to continue to you know palliate at home. So I just want to. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Stephanie. Um, I also just want to say that I am home right now. I've got two children upstairs. Uh, it's going to be lunch hour pretty shortly here. I think they're good. They know what I'm doing. <laughs> Hopefully no one's going to bother me. Um, but I just wanted to, you know, full disclosure there as well in, in case I am interrupted. Uh, so I will just share my screen here. Kind of exciting looking at the participant list uh, and recognizing all the uh, backgrounds that you're sharing um, or that you're coming to this from um, across the north. It looks like we have quite a few uh, participants or attendees uh, that are also in the northeast um, and then across the northwest here from, from a variety of backgrounds, which is really exciting because I think like for me, this is the one uh, big takeaway from supporting patients at home is that we all have a role to play. So I may not be directly acknowledging your role in this presentation, 
Um, but we do all, like as clinicians, at, at some point of contact, whether we're in leadership or, <clears throat> you know, we're frontline, um, we have some role to play in ensuring that, um, you know, we're meeting the needs of our, of our population. So. Uh, I am not affiliated with any organizations that I will mention throughout uh, this presentation. And learning objectives, you know, by the end of this presentation, um, you know, I'm wanting you to be able to reflect on what a patient's um, final days and hours might look like, right? Because we need, we're also needing to recognize when it is when is it appropriate to be putting in this level of care? And how are we helping prepare this family and this patient for this? Um, we need to be able to recognize the signs of imminent death, again, so we can provide that education in a timely way, but that we're also communicating as a healthcare system with each other in a timely way, doing our assessments, um, and just everything that goes along with that. Um, the symptom management kit is intended to be in the home uh, as a preventative measure, like in anticipation of potential change in, in symptoms. Um, and so we're needing to do some of this work proactively. Um, and then we will also just touch base on end of life care within the co context of COVID-19. So I figured we just start with the basics. Um, in terms of palliative care and what that palliative care, what that palliative approach to care looks like, and you know, hopefully many of you are aware that uh, that palliative approach is really a philosophy of care about um, trying to relieve suffering and improve quality of living and dying as patients and and their family are nearing end of life and going through those very challenging times. Um, palliative care also acknowledges all the interdependence of um, various causes of suffering, right? Like our psychological suffering, um, as our roles change or our anticipated grief, um, you know, this, the spiritual context that we are um, coming from in terms of understanding our own death um, and all the cultural norms and values and you know, really there's a lot going on and palliative, that palliative approach is that holistic approach that is um, identifying and then supporting all those different, um, you know, potential causes of suffering and helping patients like realize, like actualize their best outcome, which of course is unfortunately <laughs> death, but you know, we, we want to make that as supported and, um, and patient-centered as, as possible. Um, and just that team approach is really essential. So in terms of our phases of palliative care, um, and I reference the palliative performance scale here in this presentation, um, I haven't specifically included the palliative performance scale, um, but just for those of you that maybe are not aware, the palliative performance scale is used quite consistently across the Northwest to talk, you know, between clinicians and caregivers about really like where is, where is this patient at in, the, in terms of their needs. Um, so, you know, for you and I, like most pe people at this table, I, I would anticipate since we're all working and sort of out and about in the community, you know, that we're functioning very well, right? And this is all about our level of functioning. So we'd be probably 90 to 100% in terms of not having disease burden, not be declining in any way. Um, but with the, with the diagnosis of a chronic disease or, or of a, you know, some sort of life limiting illness, whether it's COPD or chronic heart failure, um, renal failure, cancer, you know, we see that, you know, patients start to decline and need more care. So the early palliative phase is really when patients are still ambulatory, but they have some sort of like new diagnosis that is likely to end their life or to contribute to their death at some point. Um, and patients can live within this 
early palliative phase for years and years and years. Um, you know, you think of your uh, renal failure patients that are on dialysis. You know, we recognize that they have a life limiting illness, but it, it could live for decades, <laughs> um, potentially. Um, and then there's your more advanced palliative phase where your functioning is reduced, assistance is likely required. This is often when we get referrals here at home and community care, um, where you know patients are starting to need assistance with their care, whether it's wound care, you know, because their their diabetes has led to limb loss, or you know something is happening where they're they're declining and they're needing more assistance, and we're recognizing that they're more vulnerable at that stage, right? The hospital admissions are more likely. There's more people in the healthcare system that are starting to be involved in that patient's care. And the PPS that would be associated with that is generally like 40 to 60%. So, you know, we're recognizing they're needing more support and that something like an infection or, um, you know, if they had a fall because of their de decreased mobility, like something could actually lead to their death at that point too, right? So hopefully we're starting to having some of those goals of care conversations. Um, you know, we're starting to talk about who would be their substitute decision maker. Like we're, we're starting to have all those conversations about, you know, if you were, you know, anticipating you're probably going to continue to decline or, you know, we'll say it in wonderful tactful ways. Um, hypothetically, who would you want involved in your care and what would you like that to look like? Where would you like to be? Right. And we want to be doing a lot of this work before we enter the, enter the, into the terminal palliative phase uh, where we're seeing patients are mostly bed bound, either in hospital or in community, um, and they're starting to require total care. So at this point, um, their death could occur quite quickly, or they, you know, sometimes patients will last for for weeks or even months sometimes, right? In this phase where they're bed bound and they're just sort of like slowly dwindling. Uh, but for these patients, if they're wanting to remain at home and we anticipate that they may have some symptoms that need to be managed at home, then we're looking at putting in that symptom management kit. Um, and again, sort of generally we're saying when PPS is about 40%, that we will look at putting in the symptom management kit if it's appropriate uh, for those patients. Um, again, sort of recognizing that their goals of care are to stay home. They have family that are gonna support them. Um, you know, they're sort of aware that their death is becoming more like foreseeable um, and we're starting to do some of those, some of that planning. So I already talked a little bit about this, but these are all the various pieces that should be in place um, if we are also talking about that symptom management kit. Basically, we're preparing for death at home. Um, and that symptom management kit could just be one part of that preparation. Otherwise, you know, we really need to make sure that there are goals of care, um, that substitute decision maker, uh, that we've had conversations about the do not resuscitate order. Um, you know, we want to make sure they're really making informed decisions, that they also know about uh, palliative sedation, um, medical assistance in dying may be something that, that we're talking to them about. Um, the Edith form or the expected death in the home form is used throughout a lot of the Northwest uh, in terms of letting the OPP know that there's this planned death at home. And um, these are all the um, measures that are in place to support this so that OPP doesn't have to be involved. Um, yeah, we're talking about where they wanna die. I mean, they may be saying that they would think they would prefer to stay at home, but recognizing that their family may not be able to support them or um, you know, there may be some reason why they also would like a referral to hospice. So there could be a backup plan with a referral to hospice. Um, there are co-located hospice bed spaces across the Northwest, plus here in Thunder Bay, um, so that if they aren't able to continue to palliate at home, they can go into hospice. Or if they have a pain crisis and we're not able to manage them at home, um, they can go into hospice for sort of a tune-up and then, and then come back out. 
So there's often many things in place. So in terms of the terminal palliative phase, recognizing that death is approaching, um, you know, there's profound weakness. Uh, we often have a, um, a hospital bed in place with a robo cushion. We're concerned about skin breakdown, um, you know, because they're, they're bed bound. It could be incontinent. Um, we may have in, initiated a catheter. Uh, they have diminished intake with food and fluids. So this is where this education piece with family is super important um, and with the patient themselves and sort of normalizing that process uh, so that, you know, family and friends are often quite distressed about the patient no longer eating and feeling, you know, compelled to feed them. Uh, but you know, it is part of the normal dying process is to, to not have any interest in, in food or fluid. Uh, so there's a big opportunity there for uh, education and support. Um, the difficulty swallowing medicine is a big reason why we put the symptom management kit in place uh, because they may have been well supported by their oral medications for say pain, but then they're no longer able to swallow. And if we aren't able to use a subcutaneous method to get those medications into them, um, then they will have a pain crisis. So, uh, and we don't necessarily know when that's gonna happen uh, in terms of no longer being able to swallow. So that can be another indication of, or that is a, a major indication of when to put the symptom management kit in is in anticipation of that. Um, yeah, and that PPS, which we've talked about. And then in terms of death actually being imminent, and this is you know, a big teaching part for say nurses at the bedside or those family members so that they're really sort of comfortable in understanding what is happening is um, altered breathing, decreased consciousness, uh, that molting of the periphery, uh, cold extremities. And um, you know, we hear about the, the death rattle there's the secretions in the, in the airway. So the purpose of that symptom management kit is for the rapid onset and unanticipated symptoms at end of life. And we are, I mean, they're anticipated and we think that they're maybe gonna happen, but we don't know when or exactly what it's gonna look like. So we're putting the, these medications and supplies into the home to hopefully cover our bases, basically, uh, for 24, 48, 48 72 hours um, until we are able to connect back with that primary care or that clinician that wrote the initial order to get um, updated orders. So basically, you know, we just want to have some uh, meds on hand so that when that visiting nurse goes in to um, see the patient and they recognize their symptoms, that there's something actually on hand uh, to support them. So we don't have to call EMS, we don't have to send them to eMERGE, and they don't have to um, sit and sort of needlessly uh, potentially be experiencing pain or anxiety or breathlessness um, that are sort of our standard end of life type symptoms that we're that we are supporting. Um, you know, we don't, because, you know, for us to connect with the clinician and get orders and then the orders to come to home and community care and then for us to send them to pharmacy and then pharmacy to fill it and then to get it delivered. I mean, you can appreciate that even when we're working under like urgent circumstances, it can take many hours for that to happen. And if the patient is in uh, a small community or you know somewhere more remote, it can take like even days potentially to get those supplies to them. I mean, there's there's things that we have on hand in the event that that does happen, so we can respond more quickly. Uh, but it's possible. So really, we're just sort of saying yes, this is the plan. Um, patients agreeable, families agreeable. We're going to get that kid in there so that if this happens, we're ready. Uh, 
Uh, so a lot of this is kind of duplication, but I think the main takeaway from this slide is really it's, it's everyone's responsibility that is involved in the care of this patient um, to talk about um, the appropriateness of putting, putting the kid into the home. So it could be the RPN, the RN, the nurse practitioner, the physician, the care coordinator, um, or, you know, even potentially somebody else that's involved in the care of this patient that's kind of like, you know what, I think this patient's uh, declining, you know, they might be at risk for not being able to swallow anymore. They live in, you know, somewhere outside of a major city center. Um, I know that they're wanting to die at home or at least potentially have it as an option. Uh, you know, we should be talking about this as a team. So if this is something that could be brought up on rounds or, uh, you know, the person that sort of identifies this need should get in touch with the physician or nurse practitioner, say, hey, you know what, this is my assessment. These are my thoughts. Um, what do you think, right? Do you think this is appropriate? And then you can have that conversation um, and then uh, get the kid out there. Catherine? Yes. Sorry to interrupt you. That's okay. Um, just had a question going back to a previous slide around providing options. Um, it included MAID and someone is saying, it is my understanding this needed to first be brought forward by the patient family, not a member of the healthcare team. Is this correct? <laughs> uh, wish we had our MAID coordinator on the phone. I, you know what, honestly, I, would like to look at the college and nurses guidance document on MAID again before answering that question, because I know it is one that um, gets bounced around quite a bit and different professional organizations give different advice. Um, I can send on some information, but I, I don't really wanna take a stab at it. That would be great, Catherine, if you wanna send me that information and I can yeah. send it to everybody afterwards. And with changes in the legislation, especially, yeah, be good to Because there's, there's a lot of discussion around like informed decision-making, right? And so in order to make an informed decision, you need to know what all the available options are to you. But then there's also concern that by like mentioning made that you're somehow like influencing that patient's decision to then pursue aid. So that's why I think they're different colleges have written different things. Um, and I have read them, it's just been a while. So I just don't want to, uh, I don't want to put my, I don't want to answer it. <laughs> that's fair enough, we can follow yeah. up. <laughs> okay. Well, and then some truly believe that MAID is not part is not part of a palliative approach to care, that it is outside of um, palliation. So again, there's just lots of um, different beliefs and sort of how that should be handled. Was there anything else or did, did anyone else wanna make a comment or have a question at this point? Uh, there was one other comment, Catherine, in the chat. It just said, uh, not everyone necessarily wants to die in bed. I've had a person want to be in their recliner and another in a garden. Uh, being in a bed is stereotypical. <laughs> very true. Yes, very true. And again, when we're developing this patient-centered care plan, we're, we're wanting to support them in wherever it is that they are wanting to be. So... It, yeah, ex exactly. I mean, if they're wanting to be in their single bed on the floor and that is their preference and that's where they want to be, then that's where we're supporting them. Um, it, it is entirely patient centered. Thanks for calling me out on that one, though. Um, all right, okay, so another uh, thing here, just in terms of assessing for appropriateness is, you know, we're recognizing from experience that the, fam the family or a caregiver, an informal caregiver is very, very important to have on board throughout this 
process, you know, of supporting um, someone to die at home and especially around the use of the symptom management kit, because, you know, the nurse will maybe just go once a day or a couple times a day, uh, or sometimes even less than that, depending on the frequency that is needed or like the supports that are available in that community. Um, and they will draw up syringes in, in advance. You know, once the kit is actually being used, they'll draw up syringes in advance uh, or the medications in advance. And then the family or caregiver will actually be administering the medication once, like, once they're comfortable and there's teaching and they're documenting on the patient more. And like, there's, there's again, a whole um, like level of support that is needed for the family or informal caregiver uh, outside, of, outside of our formal resources. So that's super important in terms of having those conversations. Um, and also there can be risk of medication diversion, right? Just some households just may be an unsafe place to leave uh, opioids um, because there are opioids included in these kits. Um, and if the kit is put into the home in advance, you know, it's really important that it goes somewhere secure and that it's documented where it's going. It's out of reach of children, out of reach of pets, um, or out of reach of, you know, traffic coming in out of the house, um, that it's tucked away somewhere uh, consistently. Because we've also had examples where the kit has been put into the home, some time has passed, and then it's needed, and then nobody knows where it is. And um, obviously that, that causes some, some challenges. Um, so in terms of timing, you know, I know I've identified just what a huge geography that we have here in Northwestern Ontario and just some of our challenges around uh, resources. You know, in some of our communities, it takes up to 72 hours to get um, those supplies to the home uh, because we have sort of like regularly scheduled uh, delivery, deliveries of those supplies. Again, for a lot of communities, we've sort of worked out other like more informal ways to have these supplies on hand, um, but we can't like, uh, like we can't necessarily count on that being the case that they're, uh, that they're available. Really, I mean, it's the, the team's responsibility that when, when possible, you know, that we're anticipating these, these deaths and these situations so we can get things in, it, in advance. Of course, it does not always happen that way. I mean, death is um, death is not like something that's standard, right? I mean, we may think that the patient's gonna live for another month and then all of a sudden they take a turn and things happen really quickly. So, you know, really we're just doing our best, you know, to make sure that these conversations are being had and that we're being proactive. So in terms of administering the medication, depending on the presenting symptom, and again, I sort of highlighted a couple of those, breathlessness, um, anxiety, uh, delirium, pain, uh, the nurse that's in the home or, or the clinician, if they're there, will select the appropriate medication from the kit, um, you know, confirm with the order set, and contact the physician or nurse practitioner if they have any questions or if they're not really sure about proceeding. You know, it's really important to reach out to your clinical supports. I mean, that may be within the nurse's own organization in terms of reaching out to another nurse to say, hey, you know, I'm thinking about doing this. What do you think? Um, just making sure that that nurse has support within that moment. Um, and then once the kit is initiated, making sure that that original clinician, so that, that nurse practitioner or that physician that wrote that initial order is also notified uh, that the kit has been initiated. Partially because we're talking about a change in symptom burden. So something has happened in terms of uh, the patient and their decline. So it's really important that the clinician be um, included in, you know, in terms of that circle of care and that they're knowledgeable. Um, and also we're probably going to need uh, additional like medication refills, right? If we're accessing the kit, that's really just meant to 
carry for a, a short period of time. So the clinician's gonna have to order more, uh, you know, morphine or, or whatever it is. Uh, in terms of additional resources being out there, the Northwest Regional Palliative Care Program also has a 24-7 line, uh, which is staffed by a nurse during regular business hours, like a dedicated nurse during regular business hours, and then after hours, weekends, holidays, etc., uh, the line goes to hospice uh, at St. Joe's, and one of the nurses there will pick up. So again, we just really want to make sure that everyone within the system across the Northwest is aware that that resource is available so that nobody's feeling alone, right? If they're at the bedside and for some reason don't have their own clinical support within their own team or they're not able to get in touch with a physician or nurse practitioner, uh, that there, there, there's also this other uh, resource available to them. Um, also, in terms of like ongoing supports and resources and providing education such as this, um, sharing various pamphlets that can be used for teaching with families or with patients. Um, you know, I'm a resource that can be connected with at any time. Um, we've got lots of various tools in our tool belt uh, that we can either share with yourself if you're, if you're looking for resources. Um, or, you know, if you're working on developing your own program, you know, we can learn from each other. And uh, so I also am available as, as that kind of support too. Not in the moment, right? If you're at the bedside and um, needing assistance in figuring out what medication to give, I encourage you to reach out to all your other clinical support people. Um, but I am happy to always share like resources and, you know, tips and tricks in terms of having advanced care planning conversations, or if you'd like more information about the palliative performance scale, all that kind of stuff. So what is in the kit, right? Like having all these conversations about the kit, but we haven't really talked about what's in there yet. Uh, so these are the clinical guidelines uh, for the symptom management kit and the actual forms included in a, in a few slides. Um, so the number one symptom that I think patients and their, well, patients are really concerned about when they're heading towards end of life that, you know, they're really worried about pain. Am I going to experience pain? Is this something that is going to be really like um, painful for me? And, you know, we can provide them these oral medications, but then also hopefully alleviate some anxiety and them knowing that there's also, you know, these subcutaneous meds that are available in the home so that if there is a pain crisis, they're not able to swallow, um, that we are able to then dip it, like we're able to access these other meds. Um, so just some information here about, uh, you know, assessing for pain um, and pharmacologic, non-pharmacologic, and the various, uh, like the two main medications that are used in this situation are morphine and hydromorphone. And just a little bit of direction about whether or not if the patients will be naive or if they have been already on a uh, pain medication then they will be able to tolerate more. And generally the rule is that breakthrough dose is usually 10% of the total 24 hour dose administered every one to two hours PRN. So on the standard order set, I'll show you shortly, um, it is written standardly, but sometimes clinicians will also cross that off and then write what they think is most appropriate for that patient and their condition. Say if we have if we're treating somebody that is very opioid tolerant, um, then we're going to need to adjust, you know, the breakthrough dose accordingly. Um, another really important thing to talk about, I think, with pain and acknowledge um, around these opioids, is, you know, I've just found, and I know that. It, just in speaking with people like across, you know, the healthcare system, there can be a lot of concerns about 
using opioids just in general, right? People are concerned about tolerance, they're concerned about addiction, they're concerned about sort of the stigma around using morphine or hydromorphone. And it's kind of interesting for me because I think, well, you know, you're you're getting close to the end of your life, right? I mean, you've you've identified that being comfortable is very important to you. And that's like one of your goals. Um, and yet there can be a hesitation and concern about the initiation of um, an opioid. And so this is like where teaching and having those conversations and like providing that education with patient and family is so important. Um, and that, you know, in terms of like the dosaging, they sometimes people do end up on significant amounts of these medications because it's required to like handle their pain. And again, if their goal is to not be in a, like to not have pain, um, you know, really like those, those doses and using high doses and palliative care is a, like is a very acceptable, safe practice um, to manage that pain, especially like cancer pain. Like patients can end up on a lot of, a lot, like very, very high doses that, you know, normal members within community would, would not be like it wouldn't be appropriate for them, right? It wouldn't be indicated. But when you have like a cancer type pain and maybe like a long history of using uh, these narcotics for like a very focused reason that's required, um, then high doses can be um, required. So again, it's just like the importance of, of teaching and, and talking about stigma potentially that, that they have regarding these medications um, or their families may have, you know, if there's like been a history of abuse or a history of like inappropriate drug use or, you know, it's just important to be sort of a mindful of like where patients are coming from on that and then make sure that, you know, we're providing the appropriate information and education. Um, Dyspnea and anxiety related to dyspnea. Uh, and again, morphine and hydromorph can be used uh, for that. And then there's some considerations here. And this will all be sent out. Plus, we do have a symptom management guidance document that we can send out as well. I do have the link further on in the presentation. Um, but if you're wanting to use this, like within your practice or like in for education, um, you know, we'll make sure you have all this. Around agitation and delirium. And again, we're, we're talking about the type of delirium that is really upsetting, um, is traumatic, uh, like, it's, um, like it's inconsolable type delirium, right? It's often as patients are progressing towards end of life, like their, you know, their consciousness uh, can change, right? In terms of potentially seeing things and various cultures will, you know, potentially think of it as like spirits from the other side, you know, being there to like support them onto the afterlife. So we're not really talking about that sort of like mild delirium. We're talking here about like more significant delirium agitation uh, where it's very upsetting um, and it's inconsolable um, and it's like really, really needs or requires like a medical intervention um, because it's like very upsetting uh, to watch like more like writhing sort of thing. Um, so there's various medications that can be used for that and have been included in the kit. Um, and nausea. And important to note that nausea can also be caused by the initiation of um, opioids as well. I mean, it subsides, but uh, that can also be uh, a side effect of those opioids as well as constipation. So important to also treat for that and assess for that. Um, we also had included the symptom of seizure. Again, I, I've just, in my experience and in speaking with clinicians around me, I hear that this isn't very common, but uh, 
had included uh, some medication suggestions there. And then terminal secretions. So this we're talking about, you know, that that death rattle. Um, and often it is, you know, it's upsetting for family or caregivers around the patient, but it's generally understood that it's not upsetting, like there's no distress to the patient. They're like, they're not really aware at this point of the sound that they're making. It's not, um, yeah, it's, it's really that the, their caregivers, it can be quite upsetting to them um, and repositioning can help with that in terms of slightly raising the head of the bed, you know, making sure that mouth care is being given, um, counseling family uh, or caregivers that that rattling is normal. Uh, but scopolamine can also be used uh, to help uh, subside some of those. Uh, so this is our standard order form. Um, so you can see the medications are all listed there. Uh, there's also uh, space for other medications to be put in. So say for that, uh, for the seizure medications that were suggested, you know, they could be included there. Uh, your hydromorphine or hydromorphone and morphine. Um, and then other as well there in terms of opioids. And like I said, you know, I, I have seen clinicians also, if this is not an appropriate um, or reasonable dose for this patient to also cross it off and, and make notes for the pharmacy um, to adjust that medication amount. Um, and then with this, with these uh, medications, there's also supplies. So all the supplies for, uh, you know, initiating the sub-Q line and syringes. Uh, there's a Foley catheter that's also included and an intermittent catheter in case, you know, they are experiencing urinary retention. And, um, and then the nurse will often also order other supplies like, uh, you know, the blue, the blue pads, um, you know, mouth care swabs, you know, there, there's other supplies that we would also potentially be ordering at this time as well. So the nurse practitioner or physician would complete the form and fax to the, us with home and community care and to the local dispensing pharmacy. So very like any pharmacy across the Northwest that has access to these medications can fill, uh, can fill the script. Uh, but then the supplies, so this SKU zero or IVK 077, um, the supplies do have to go through our vendor through home and community care, which is shoppers. So I think this is something we were actually just talking at a team meeting this morning about this because this, this can cause some confusion is we call the kit, the kit for the symptom management kit, and we mean it to be the supplies and medication. But sometimes we have shoppers filling the supplies and we have uh, say Walmart pharmacy and Kenora filling the medications. And so if this is the case, we need to be really clear on our language to families and to each other as to who is doing what. Um, because if the family calls shoppers saying, hey, I need the kit, and shoppers thinks that they need the medications, but really it's gone to Walmart, um, it can cause a lot of confusion. So that's something we've been talking about and thinking about, like, how do we change our language around that? Um, like, how do we make that more clear? so that we're alleviating some distress to the family because if the family's then calling shoppers saying, where are my medications? And shoppers are saying, we only got supplies. Like it's, you know, I think you can appreciate that using a, the kit, like symptom management kit is meaning a whole kit, but then sometimes having two players fulfilling that kit can cause some problems. And so we were just talking about saying symptom management medications symptom management, supplies, um, and sort of defining like where those are, where those are going to and where they're being um, 
brought in from, and then making sure that the family knows which is being delivered, which needs to be picked up. Um, you know, there's there's major coordination piece that has to happen there. So, and language is important. So just something to take away if um, you're using this. Any comments or reflections? Nothing in the chat box right now, Catherine. Okay. And so this order form is here in this presentation, of course, but if for whatever reason you also wanted uh, it, I can send that along. So how can we talk about symptom management and end of life without also just mentioning COVID? <laughs> um, so COVID obviously has been all of our focus for the last year and a half or uh, yeah, I guess it's been almost a year and a half. Um, so I just wanted to share this resource that was developed by the Ontario Palliative Care Network. The latest version, and I did just go on the website uh, as I was putting together this presentation to make sure that I put up the newest version that was published May 11th, 2020. But just please, you know, make sure you're going to the website for the primary source if you are actually referencing this and using it within your practice. Um, but sort of, of, of interest and I think comfort for me is knowing that you know, the symptom management for adult patients with COVID-19 is really very similar to the symptom management kit that we use with home and community care. Um, the medications are, you know, similar. Um, and it just talks about how it's super important to have those goals of care conversations, you know, to make sure we're accessing resources like Speak Up Ontario, if, if we're not sure like how to initiate those conversations because that's sort of the cornerstone of the work that we're doing is we're making sure yes this is what the patient wants they want to be at home um, we're recognizing that they're sort of knowledgeable and informed about what that means and what's available to them and then um, we're talking about how we can manage their symptoms if they're saying that this is what's important to them right they want to be at home and they want to be without respiratory distress or pain or you know, delirium. <clears throat> um, but the one piece that is on here that is unique is just talking about the aerosol generating procedures um, that of course we're concerned about for COVID-19 um, in terms of like high flow oxygen, uh, BiPAP, CPAP, uh, you know, the various interventions that could potentially also be in use that would then put like clinicians or family members, um, like anybody involved in care at higher risk. And basically just to avoid them if, if possible. So palliative care at home in the context of COVID-19, I think, you know, for those that are supporting patients nearing end of life, having to fully glove and gown and visor and be super aware of like the distance between yourself and patient and family members. I mean, these have these pieces have all impacted how we're supporting patients at home and, and like the relationships that we're developing. We're, we're trying to do a lot of the work we do virtually. Um, I mean, there's still a lot of face to face care going on. But, you know, we're dressed like we're in spacesuits. <laughs> um, and I think it, you know, it can potentially interrupt some of the intimacy that often we try to establish with patients and families um, near the end of life. I'm, you know, I'm not hearing that it has hugely impacted, but it's certainly like a, a concern or something that we're aware of. And I'm, I'm interested to see some of the data, you know, and, and um, research projects that are going to come out of this time uh, as people reflect about how these how this has changed the experience. 
just all the COVID-19 screening. I mean, we know about this so well at this point um, in terms of limitations of visitors and screening and travel. And I mean, it is just another layer of, uh, you know, onerous and stressful context, right, to the care that we're providing, or to the care that the family is trying to provide to each other too, right? If there's limitations on travel, like potentially that daughter that was going to come from California to provide care to her mother, like there's, you know, there's just more, it's challenging. Uh, there have been medication changes because a lot of the medications uh, that are in the symptom management kit, as you saw, are also being used for COVID, um, so at times there have been shortages or they just have not been available. I mean, fortunately, those have all resolved themselves in pretty like short order. Um, but we've been talking with pharmacy about maybe not filling as much of the order uh, because we don't know whether or not the patient's going to need that medication. And we don't want that medication to be wasted because we may or may not even use the kit. Um, because there's just shortages within the system, right? It's, a, it's affected everything related to, to these medications because of the high demand. And really just talking about just the education that potentially is needed by that patient and their family in the context of COVID, even if they're, this isn't a COVID patient, but just normally, right? Like it's somebody that's wanting to die at home. Um, it's just a whole added layer of care that's required around COVID. And again, I know that we all know this so well <laughs> at this point. Did anyone have anything they wanted to add related to that? One positive thing that I think will come out of this uh, is our use of virtual and being more flexible in that way um, by providing both telephone and video and face-to-face -face type care. I think that the whole system has been a uh, challenge to develop that and I, you know, it'll be lasting. And, um, and I think there's, again, the huge geography that we're living within here. Um, I think that's just, it's positive. My silver lining. Uh, so I have added all my references and resources at the end here. Uh, the symptom management kit guidance document under resources. This is the link to our website and I have put it on there partially because I'm thinking of the symptom management kit guidance document as being a living document. Uh, you know, we're wanting to continue to review it and make changes and, um, and improve our practice. Uh, so rather than sending everybody out the actual document, I'm wanting to just send out a link so that if you're going in to access it, you can see the most recent and up to date. Um, and given that, like, I'm very uh, curious to hear what you guys across other Lynn areas um, are doing. Um, so I would be also happy to receive emails from you if you uh, have something you'd like to share with me in terms of that knowledge sharing. And just try to, to include all the other resources that I referenced here. And, uh, and that's me. So in terms of presentation, uh, that's all I have. I'm happy to have a little discussion. I know we're at five two now, but um... thank you very much, Catherine. So, people at this time, if you would like, you can feel free to come off mute, ask any questions, make comments. And that's great, Catherine, that you have the resources um, linked right there. So we'll send out a copy of those slides so everyone will have those links so they can find the, the guidance document um, and the other resources like you mentioned. And then we can follow up around the MAID question. Yes. Mm -hmm.
for the maid question, um, if you're still on the line, if you could also let me know from like what um, like vantage point you're asking the question, like if you're a nurse or a clinician or, or like a physician or a PSW or like, I think that will also help me answer the question. Getting a lot of thank yous. It was very thorough, <laughs> Catherine. Not a lot of questions. So I did just launch our poll for the session if people don't mind completing that for us before you uh, carry on with your day. Uh, thank you very much, Catherine, for the session today on behalf of Sarah and our participants. So getting some nice comments here. Okay, and she said, um, from the nursing perspective, around MAID, we're curious. Okay. And just to let others know, uh, for the month of June, which is Stroke Month, uh, we're happy to be collaborating with the Northwestern Ontario Regional Stroke Network and also the Northwest Regional Palliative Care Program on actually three lunch hour sessions throughout the month uh, related to palliative care issues around stroke. So those will be taking place on June 9th, uh, 16th and the 24th. We've been sending out information in our weekly e-blasts or bi-weekly e-blasts around those. And they're also posted on our website under our events section. Um, so yeah, I encourage you to register for those as well if you're interested. And I thank you all for joining us today and I hope you have a great afternoon. Yes, thank you so much. Mm-hmm. <laughs>